Next up, many of you know this very exciting bit of news, and that is that we will be moving to a new museum in just a few short months. The staff here is daily working towards that goal, and we're excited to get to celebrate that in the fall of 2018. But before we do that, we will have to close this facility. Uh, the, Polk muse the, the museum here at the Polk building has been open and uh, been a great venue for the Tennessee State Museum for almost 40 years. Almost 40 years. We, and some of you may remember coming on a field trip. I don't know. But we will close the doors to this facility on May 6th. And in order to send this museum off the right way, we are uh, having a, a what we are calling a pack the wagon party because we're trying to uh, make sure that it is not a closing but it is simply a move so we're we're going to pack the wagon and we're going to move all of this museum down to a brand new fascinating 21st century uh, museum down on rosa parks and jefferson street so we're very excited about that may 5th saturday may 5th we're having a family day so please come with your families and friends, and we're gonna have crafts and games and activities and giveaways and prizes, so it'll be a lot of fun. So uh, remind, remember May 5th, Saturday. Okay, that's enough for me and my commercials. Let me bring on uh, our speaker for this afternoon. Miss Linda Wynn, we are thrilled to have Miss Linda Wynn here at the Tennessee State Museum. She is the Assistant Director for State Programs at the Tennessee Historical Commission. She serves as a Professor of History at Fisk University. She is the co-founder of the African American History Conference at uh, TSU every February. And she is a prolific writer, uh, researcher and writer. Many of you know her articles and works on civil rights and women's history. She is really uh, one of the foremost historians that we are proud to have here in Tennessee. She's also a great friend of the Tennessee State Museum. She has helped us on many, many projects and many museum exhibits. Today, she will bring, a, uh, bring to us a talk, appropriately enough for this month, after um, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. She'll bring to us a talk entitled, Remembering the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and His Liberatory and Radical Dream. Let's welcome Ms. Wynn. Thank you, Jeff. First of all, to the audience, let me apologize. I have been suffering with voice issues for the, almost the last month. So let me know if you cannot hear me. I know you won't hear me as clearly and distinctly as I would like for you to. Uh, I also want to thank Jeff for inviting me here today to speak on this timely topic. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not recognize my executive director, Mr. Patrick McIntyre. Thank you, Patrick, for coming. Um, also, Mr. Tim Walker, who is with the Metro Historical Commission, on whose board I serve, and Jim Hoopler, who we have been friends for a very long, long time, and he also serves on the Metro Historical Commission. I hope there's no one in the audience that I'm missing. Um, if it is, please charge it to my head and not to my heart. The topic that I want to talk about today is remembering Dr. Martin Luther King and his liberatory and radical dream. On April 4th, 50 years after his assassination, the nation paused to remember the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was one of the most, if not the most, charismatic leaders of the modern civil rights movement. A staunch advocate for those rights denied African Americans, he used the devices of nonviolence and civil disobedience, grounded in his Christian beliefs and inspired by the nonviolent activism of Mahatma Gandhi to bring those rights to fruition. However, 
According to volume one of the papers of Martin Luther King Jr. called to serve, it was during his matriculation at Atlanta's Morehouse College that King responded to an inner urge summoning him to serve humanity. Although he and his followers practiced nonviolence, Fallon silenced the visionary voice. King may be America's most honored political figure, commemorated in statues, celebrations, and street names throughout the globe. On the 50th anniversary of his assassination, the man who believed and articulated in his 1963 lecture, Letter from a Birmingham Jail, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It is acknowledged through political and public awareness as ever. Yet it must be remembered that while some wanted to celebrate the whole king, others wanted to celebrate just one king. The king frozen on Washington's mall in August of 1963, who longed for the day that his children would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. They molded him into a gentle champion of color blindness. Americans pick and choose which parts of his career they want to embrace. Many Americans sanitized his message and disinfected its meaning ultimately replacing the historical king who was a courageous dissident who unsettled the powerful with a mythical king. Prior to his participation in the 1968 sanitation worker strike in Tennessee, King was no stranger to the volunteer state. Most Nashvilleans and Tennesseans remember at least two pivotal times he came to the city and maybe some remember his 1957 address in Mount Eagle, where he spoke to an audience at Highlander. Let me just give a little uh, 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 parenthetical statement here. Today is April the 19th. This is the day that attorney Z. Alexander Luby's home was bombed in 1960 here in Nashville because he can be considered and was considered the father of civil rights in Nashville and Tennessee. Attorney Luby crisscrossed the state fighting for the rights of African Americans. Some can even credit, and many do credit, Z. Alexander Luby with saving the life of Thurgood Marshall the individual who would become the first African American to sit on the United States Supreme Court. That was in 1946, when the first riot after World War II took place in Columbia. Marshall and Luby were representing those African Americans who were arrested in that case in that riot. And as they were traveling back and forth, one night the law enforcement officials who some identified as part of the KKK stopped the car and Luby told Marshall, don't get out. If you get out, we'll never see you again. And it was because of what Luby said and how he spoke to those officials that the life of Thurgood Marshall was spared. And he went on to become that United States Supreme Court Justice. So when we look at April the 20th, that is the day that most Nashvilleans remember when King came to Nashville. 
He came, as I said, after the bombing of Z. Alexander Luby's home, and he addressed a massive gathering at Fisk University in the gym, the Henderson A. Johnson gym. His visit coincided with what was going on in Nashville at the time, which was the sit-ins, conducted by those students from the city's historically black colleges, Fisk University, American Baptist College, Meharry Medical College, and Tennessee a and State University at that time. Another time that you might remember King being here would be in 1967 when he spoke at Vanderbilt University's Impact Symposium, the same symposium that Stokely Carmichael spoke at the following day. However, those two notable visits by King was not his first. King was in and out of Nashville during the 1950s and the 1960s. In February 1956, the nascent leader of the modern civil rights movement spoke at Fisk University during the university's annual Religious Emphasis Week. The following year, on January the 13th, 1957, the Reverend King spoke at the First Baptist Church Capitol Hill and urged the audience to support the NAACP. He admonished them not to resort to violence in our struggle. He further urged them to refuse to cooperate with any form of segregation. The fight for integration, he said, is worth losing your job, going to jail, or dying. Be determined to suffer, be determined to struggle, be determined to sacrifice until the sagging walls of segregation are crushed by the battering rams of justice. Continuing, he further iterated, God struggles with us. Violence, we cannot be defeated because God cannot be defeated. God struggles with us. Four months later, on April the 23rd, 1957, King was one of the speakers at the conference on Christian faith and human relations at Vanderbilt University. It would be three years before King would return to Nashville. And King looked at Nashville and the state of Tennessee as a part of what he described as the world house. In the world house, King calls us to look at four things. Transcend tribe, race, class, nation, and religion to embrace the vision of a world house. Eradicate at home and globally the triple evils of racism, poverty, and militarism. Curb excessive materialism and shift from a thing-oriented society to a people-oriented society. And the fourth thing he insisted upon was resist social injustice and resolve conflicts in the spirit of love embodied in the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. He advocated a Marshall Plan to eradicate global poverty, a living wage, and a guaranteed minimum annual income for every American family. Sounds familiar? We can fast forward 50 years later, and we're still talking about the same things. He urged the United Nations to experiment with the use of nonviolent direct action in international conflicts. In the final paragraph, he warned of the, quote, fierce urgency of now and cautioned 
that this may be the last chance to choose between chaos and community. In Racism in the World House, Martin Luther King provided, I think, one of his most sophisticated analysis of racism as a global phenomenon, with a special focus on both its tragic impact on people of color and its threat to human welfare and survival. His essential point was that the world house at its best could never be sustained on a foundation of personal and institutionalized racism. King was the son, grandson, great-grandson of Baptist ministers. The younger King's foundational experiences not only immersed him in the affairs of Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church, where his four parents pastored, but also familiarized him with the African-American social gospel tradition embodied by his father and grandfather, both of whom were affiliated with the Atlanta branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Depression era bread lines heightened King's awareness of economic inequities. And his father's leadership of campaigns against racial discrimination in voting and teachers' salaries provided a model for the younger King's own philosophy. During his undergraduate years at Atlanta's Morehouse College, King gradually overcame his initial reluctance to accept his inherent calling. By the end of his third year at Morehouse, King entered the ministry. Influenced by his father, Morehouse President Benjamin E. Mays and George Kelsey, a professor of religion, he described his decision as a response to an inner urge calling him to serve humanity. By the time of his senior year, he was already traversing the path of political activism. Responding to post-World War II rise of anti-black violence, King asserted in a letter to the editor of the Atlanta Constitution that African Americans were entitled to the basic rights and opportunities of American citizens. On June the 5th, 1955, King received his PhD in systematic theology from Boston University. Although Dr. King considered a career in academia, in 1954 he changed his mind and accepted the pastorate of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. This change ultimately set his life's journey on the concourse of the modern civil rights movement. Dr. King entered the modern movement in September of 1954, four months after the United States Supreme Court unanimous decision in the Brown versus Board of Education decision, when he became involved in the Montgomery bus boycott, a boycott that lasted 381 days. After the Supreme Court outlawed Alabama's bus segregation laws in the 1956 Browder versus Gale case, King and others established the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. As president, King coordinated the freedom struggle of, the, of civil rights throughout the South. The young minister's 1958 publication Stride Toward Freedom, the Montgomery story, aided in catapulting King to a position of a national civil rights leader. Notwithstanding his emergence as a recognizable leader of the burgeoning movement, instead of immediately pursuing racial desegregation campaigns in the South, in a speech entitled, Give Us the Ballot, 
at Washington's Lincoln Memorial, King underscored the objective of attaining voting rights for African Americans when he spoke before that audience on May 17th at the prayer pilgrimage for freedom. Two months earlier, King had traveled to Ghana and he began to recognize the linkage between segregation and colonialism, especially on the continent of Africa. He served as the International Sponsoring Committee for a day of protest in apartheid South Africa. King further articulated the connections between the African American freedom struggle and those abroad when he stated, we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one, affects all directly. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. From 1955 to 1968, a mere 13 years, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King worked assiduously to bring the nation in line with its stated values <coughs> as incorporated in its government documents. <coughs> From the Montgomery bus boycott to the sit-in movement, to the freedom ride movement, to the movement for voting rights, to bringing economic justice to Memphis sanitation workers who simply wanted to be treated as a man or as men and given equal wages. Prior to coming to Memphis in 1967, King announced the Poor People's Campaign a campaign and a crusade designed to urge the United States government to improve its anti-poverty efforts. This effort was in its early stages when the Reverend James Lawson asked King to come to Memphis on behalf of the Memphis sanitation workers who were striking against unfair treatment and wages. A malfunctioning garbage truck crushed E. Cole Cole and Robert Walker to death on February the 1st, 1968. After city functionaries failed to respond to their concerns, 12 days later, more than a thousand African-American men from the Memphis Department of Public Works went on strike. On March the 28th, King led thousands of sanitation workers and sympathizers on a march through downtown Memphis. However, mayhem broke out, which led the press to criticize King's anti-poverty strategy. 16-year-old Larry Payne was killed by a shotgun blast fired by a patrolman as he emerged from a basement in a housing development. Payne was the only victim of violence that followed King's sanitation march. He returned to Memphis for the last time in early April, addressing the audience at Bishop Charles J. Mason's temple on the 3rd of April. King seemed hopeful in the face of difficult days difficult days that lie ahead. He asserted, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. Continuing in that cadence of a Baptist preacher, he prophesied, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. 
The following evening while standing on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, James Earl's Ray's single bullet forever silenced the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King. One of humanity's most powerful voices for human rights and social justice. Four days after King's assassination, an estimated crowd of 42,000 people led by his widow, Coretta Scott King, SCLC, and union leaders silently marched through Memphis in honor of King and demanded that Mayor Henry Loeb III give in to the union's request. The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees pledged support for the workers until we have justice. In 1968, King was not dreaming of an America that would judge the worthiness of its people based on their individual character, regardless of their skin color. Rather, he was dreaming of one that would judge all of its people as being worthy of guaranteed health care, housing, employment, and or an unconditional living income, regardless of their character. And King understood that the realization of the former ambition in no way guaranteed the subsequent triumph of the latter one. We must see the struggle today is more difficult, King said, in the other America, the sermon he spent much of the last two years of his life preaching. It's more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. It's much easier to integrate a lunch counter, easier to guarantee the right to vote than it is to guarantee the right to live in sanitary, decent housing conditions. It's much easier to integrate a public park than it is to make genuine, quality, integrated education a reality. The core convictions that King's work in, his final, in the final years of his life, that civil equality would have little substance for much of America's black population, absent radical changes to the nation's political economy, and that such changes would be impossible to bring about absent the mass mobilization of, cro of a cross-racial coalition of the economically disadvantaged. It reigns as true today as it did five years ago, excuse me, five decades ago. When one considers the memorial to Dr. King on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., which is flanked by a granite wall with 14 quotes inscribed thereon, as Jeannie Theoris Harris notes in A More Beautiful and Terrible History, the uses and misuses of civil rights history, not one quote is chiseled with the words racism or segregation or racial inequality. His description of the experience of racism from letter from a Birmingham jail is missing. His closing words from the fight, the night of the Montgomery bus boycott, hailing a people of, hailing a race of people, a black people who had the moral courage to stand up for their right, injecting a new meaning into the veins of history and of civilization is missing. His indictment of America in the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom as defaulting on a promissory note, having given the Negro a bad check, is missing. A man who risked his life went to jail 30 times to challenge the scourge of American racism. He was quick to point out the racism of the North, along with that of the South, who wrote from jail in 1963 
that the biggest problem was not the Ku Klux Klan, but white moderates who preferred order over justice, who criticized the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism. That man of God and courage is now honored with a memorial to speak that does not speak to the problem of racism. Dr. King remained unwavering in his steadfastness to fundamentally revolutionize and reconstruct the American social order through nonviolent direct activism until his demise. In his 1969 posthumously published essay, A Testament of Hope, King asserted that white America must recognize that justice for black people and we can add today all people of color, cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society. The black revolution was more than a civil rights movement, he insisted. It is forcing America to face all of its interrelated flaws, racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. The repetitive plane of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech has deconstructed his vision of a just society based on a radical redistribution of economic and political power and made it difficult to discern that as early as the 1950s, Dr. King called for world disarmament, a dismantling of South African apartheid, a global war on poverty, and a means to assist African Americans surmount historic, structural, and systemic racism. Like the civil rights organizations of the 1930s, the drum major for justice pursued a twofold agenda of civil rights and economic justice. He was radical throughout his career which in many instances has been deleted from the historical public narrative. As historian C. Van Woodard observed, the twilight zone that lies between memory and written history is one of the favorite breeding places of mythology. Public memory has been cherry-picked, has cherry-picked King's legacy by turning his forceful battle against systemic racism into a color blindness pursuit. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King is remembered as one of America's greatest orators. An envoy of nonviolence, he became one of the most identifiable leaders of the modern civil rights movement. Yet 50 years after his assassination, many do not recognize that King's radicalism underscored his revolutionary vision. His identification with the poor, his unapologetic opposition to the Vietnam War, and his crusade against global imperialism. As Cornel West notes in The Radical King, although much of America did not know the radical king, and too few know today, the FBI and the United States government did, they called him the most dangerous man in America. Yet today, King's vision for an equitable American society manifested by a yearning for racial, social, and economic justice remains as germane as ever. What is past is prologue. Thank you. Are there any questions? Would you be able to recommend any books um, on the topic of his, the passage of time in his youth where he went through the, um, the process of finding his calling and living it out and accepting it? I would look at some of the books by um, 
Baldwin, um, professor at Vanderbilt University, uh, who is a noted King scholar. Uh, I'm trying to think of Baldwin's name. Lewis. Lewis, Lewis Baldwin, thank you. Um, I would probably also look at the volumes of the King papers that were uh, published and are being published by uh, the University Press at Stanford. Um, I would also look at, I would go back and look at some of, of King's own works, such as uh, Stride Toward Freedom, Where Do We Go From Here? Uh, I would look at uh, James Melvin's A Testament of Hope, The Essential Writings of Martin Luther King. Uh, and you might want to go back and look at the first biography on King that was written by a man named Reddick, uh, who wrote that biography, I believe, in 1957. Uh, and that's just a few. I mean, you know, obviously, uh, as we do today, if you, if you Google King's early life, uh, several books and volumes will come up about how he made this transition uh, when he was really fighting that inner urge to serve humanity, as he said. What is the transition between uh, going into the academia and returning to the South to be, to be a Baptist minister? Uh, how, how much depth was involved in that? Is it much written? <laughs> opinion on it? Uh, that has gone into in, 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 in the papers of Martin Luther King and I think there are about seven volumes that are, are written right now. So I would look at volume say one which is, is about his early life. Uh, you know right after he finished his uh, PhD he and Coretta Scott King married so you know being a preacher is not necessarily at that time one of great wealth. Uh, so I can see him looking at academia. Uh, it, it may have provided more st stability. If you're familiar with the Baptist church and especially the black Baptist church, it is independent. It's not like the United Methodist or the AMEs, the pastor serves at the pleasure of the congregation. So he may have, you know, originally thought that academia would have been, would provide more stability. Uh, but again, you know, if you look at King, King was only 15 years old when he entered Morehouse. And he came out on time, so that means he was 19. When King went to Montgomery, he was only 26. Uh, basically, King lived in a middle class, lived a middle class life. Uh, but being surrounded by, and his forefathers being steeped in the Baptist church, I can see how one would struggle with that dichotomy of, because you know when you get your PhD you want to go into, into academia but also having that background and your forefathers steeped in that Baptist tradition. And I would imagine that Daddy King, as they called him, may have had a great influence on, on helping him make that decision to go into the ministry. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for sharing uh, a, a great, wonderful talk. But also, thank you for sharing your weakened voice <laughs> uh, with us this afternoon. Now, what are you about to do now? Uh, now I am about to go to class. <laughs> She's got to go teach a class now. <laughs> so and, thank and you. And fortunately, it, we were ending the semester, so this is the last day. <laughs> And perhaps now I can do what my doctor told me to do, rest my voice. <laughs> Thank you for doing that after, Linda. <laughs>
That was great. Thank you so much. Folks, thanks for attending. Next week, next Thursday, is our final Lunch and Learn, where um, our own chief curator, Dan Pomeroy, will be talking about the history of this place, the Tennessee State Museum. So come back next week, this time, and we'll see you there. Thanks for coming.